Not yet. I did do one of the stories I did, um, Sasha Dewan played a character in it. I can't remember the name of the story, but Nissa and his character had quite a few scenes together, and that was a joy. He's absolutely wonderful, and I think he's fabulous as the master. I think he's uh, he's got it right spot on. I, he's a fantastic actor. Um, so she rang the director, bless her, and she said, I've got this little girl who I think would be great for the part of Baby Roo. Will you see her? And he said, no. He said, no, because Baby Roo is going to be played by a boy. I have 99 boys auditioning. And he said, oh, for God's sake, send her along, but she'll be the only girl there. There's 99 boys. I was eight at this time. And I had a little song that I was pre had prepared to ring. And I walked onto the stage and I just burst into tears. Because that wasn't a really good start because he didn't want me there anyway. <laughs> so he said, if you can pull yourself together, you can come back and have another go. So I pulled myself together and I, I did my little song. And um, I got the part. So, for the girls, 99 boys and me, and I got the part. Yes! <laughs> the BBC were then auditioning for um, a, a play that was going to be on the television called Boys and Girls Come Out to Play. And it was part of a series they were doing called Menace. And so it was after the nine o'clock watershed, um, so not suitable for children. Um, and this particular story was written by a guy called James McTaggart. And I auditioned for that one for a character called Belinda. And again, I, I was 11 at this point, so I had a very strange childhood. I would, <laughs> Belinda, which I got the part, Belinda was the daughter of a policeman who was taking bribes. And Belinda likes to go out at night. So she climbed down out of her window at night down the trellis outside, and she'd go out, and she'd pick up two of her friends, and they would go out, and she sees a murder being committed on the common, and she sees who the murderer is, and she uses this knowledge to blackmail people. I was 11. <laughs> I was, this, this was some part. And then her friend decides that she's going to sort of tell on what they've been doing at night. So one day in, in the school changing rooms, I don't know if you have them here, you have like wooden bits with hooks on, you know, where you hang your coats and everything. She grabs her friend by her, her, her collar and whacks her head against the thing. To, to, and then she pushes her in the cement mixer. <laughs> this was some part for an 11 year old. She, she had whirlwind, it, it, it happens to her as a very young person, she has a lot going on in her life. She has a stepmother, her father gets taken over by the master, she meets the doctor. Um, yes, there's a, there's a lot going on for her. Um, but I really, I really like her, I think, I think she's one of the people that if you were ever in a, in a sticky situation, you'd like her to be about, because I think she'd, she'd think about things. It's, it, it is odd because I think we all bring a little bit of ourselves to our characters, and I think there is a little bit of me in Nyssa, and that means there's a little bit of my dad, because there's quite a lot of my dad in me. My dad was um, a pilot, and he learned to fly before jet engines were invented, and he was always very thoughtful. He was a very good pilot, and he, was, he always thought things through, and it, that's come through me into Nyssa, and I can see her, if there's a problem, she will think it through. She's not a panicker. She's going to sort of think about it and find a way through. And I really like that about her. I didn't want to leave. Um, the production company decided that the TARDIS needed a bit of a, a clean out and some new, new blood and everything. So I, I understand Peter, I think, fought quite hard hard for Nyssa to stay. I think he thought Nyssa worked very well with his doctor. But it wasn't to be, and um, I left. I think, I think she could have gone on to do an awful lot of things. I think, and of course now with Big Finish, I have been given that opportunity. I mean, goodness me, I think Nyssa's had some fantastic stories, and there's also been old Nyssa, 
and young Nissa, which has been totally confusing, but great. And um, she's managed to really fill her backstory, which is which is a joy, which you would never get to do on the show. Um, so Big Finish has been fantastic for that. But I think she's I think she's running a whole series of hospitals. I think she's a hospital manager now. I think she's still in the healthcare system. I'm pretty convinced she'd still be doing that because I know she felt very strongly about it. So I think she'd be doing that and she'd be running a hospital. And I'm kind of hoping the doctor might sort of swing by one day. <laughs> he, might, he might be in need of treatment and he'd have to swing by the hospital and find her and she's going to help out. Yeah. That's what I hope. I thought, what is this? Um, because that, again, that was a long time ago. That was probably how long has Big Finish been doing? Uh, Win- Twenty-ish years. Yeah, so I think the one, the first one I did was either Winter for the Adept, of the Adept or Land of the Dead. Those two of my first two stories, and I thought, well, it, this is fun, but won't last. You know, we'll do this, and it'll fizzle out. And I don't, I've done over fifty or something now, so. No, yeah, there are, there they're, are they're great. Times. They're great fun, and, and luckily now um, we're getting back into the studio because we did a, quite a few during COVID when we were all at home. And whilst it was lovely not to have to drive all the way up to London and back in the rush hour, I really miss not being in the studio with other people. I, I just you really you bounce off each other when you're next to each other, and um, and as Janet said, you know <laughs> we're in a row. In, in, in this glass so we can see each other, pull funny faces at each other when we're, we're working and stuff. Oh, my favorite costume. <laughs> um, probably, again, my first costume, because it, it's Nissa, and that, that is just so Nissa. It all kind of went a bit pear-shaped after that. <laughs> um, I like the trousers, because they were, it was still Nissa, but it was just a trouser version, not the skirt. Um, Peter really hated my snake dance outfit. He said I looked like a waitress from McDonald's. <laughs> um, it was really unpopular. I actually didn't think it was too bad, but I thought it was colourful, you know, it was bright and colourful. And I know John Nathan Turner often used to get letters and remarks um, to the office saying, you know, where have Nissa's legs gone? You know, so that's why I went back into a skirt from the trousers. And then my final costume, there ended up not being very much of it at all. So I went from being up here and down to here to hardly anything. Um, so it's sort of, I dread to think what happened if Aunt Nissa had stayed. <laughs> <laughs> end up with no clothes at all. Um, yeah. So I think probably my first, my first costume, and they were they were all beautifully made. And I had my my boots and my last costume were all handmade. Um, so nothing from a shop or anything. They were really beautiful. Well, I'm disregarding the taking off of the skirt thing because that was a. Comp- I have no idea what that was all about. I think. The producer just said, oh, it'd be a good idea if we just we saw this lovely underwear that she's got. <laughs> really? Um, so, so I did what I was told. Um, but the actual ending, I'm glad she didn't have um, Leela's ending where she went off and got married. I, was, I thought, oh, please don't just send her off with some alien to get married. And it just seemed so lame. Um, so I'm really pleased she, she was on a mission and she was going to do something. Um, but those tears you see when in that last scene were genuine. I was, I was, it was very sad, it was very sad for me. I'm glad she went in that way. No, I'd not really ever watched it. <laughs> I knew of his existence, everybody did. Um, but I didn't watch it very much. And it was a bit weird because I was on holiday with my, my parents. Um, we'd gone away and I, and I was thinking about my career. And I was thinking, I don't know what I'd like. I'd love to be in Doctor Who, actually. That looks really good fun. And can you believe it? When I got home, my agent called and said, oh, I've got you an audition for Doctor Who. <laughs> oh, wow, I should think about things like that more often. <laughs> um, but of course, I didn't realize that she was going to stay. I thought it was just for Keeper of Trakan at that time. Um, from what I can remember, 
I end up in the water, don't I? And, uh, <laughs> going to, going to fetch it. Fetch it. Um, yeah, I, again, location filming, so always fun. Um, the Zero Cabinet, that's what it was called, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't like much going in the water. I don't, uh, and I had to pull that funny face. Yes. <laughs> so I knew, I knew what was coming. <laughs> I knew I was going to have to go in the water and pull a funny face. Yeah. Yeah, most, most of these things are scripted. It has to be reasonably tight on um, know what you're doing. So, um, yeah, I, I was fully aware of what was going to befall. Mm. It's funny because Nissa and Tegan do a lot of teamwork in that episode. I feel like that's really where their friendship gets started. Yes, I think so. That's where they work together a lot. And, uh, yeah, they bonded, I think. They bonded over the Zero cabinet. <laughs> It's nice to be bad. Nissa's very good, so it's quite nice to have another aspect to Nissa. I particularly like that story, actually, Dalek Soul, Alien Heart, unless it's the other way around. Because um, rather selfishly, I have Peter to, to myself, um, and I think it, there's a lot of opportunity to, to explore the character more and, and to do other things with the character. Um, the story is a, a sort of a deeper, I think, when you've got just the two characters there. Um, so, but not that it's not lovely when we're all together, but I'm sure we'd all say the same. It is actually quite nice when you get just the one-on-one -on -one stories. They, they work well, I think. Well, and that's an interesting point because Nissa and the Doctor really are, they're not the same person, but they are so of similar mind, you know, yep. they, they understand each other yes. in a way that the others don't quite get. No, I think, I think, I think you're exactly right. Um, he felt he could rely on Nissa to, to do something if he needed something done. I think that's true. I think uh, maybe that's why Peter was quite keen to keep Nissa as the companion. Um, it, yeah, it's a tricky one. Oh, Colin and Ark of Infinity. Gosh, we had laughs doing that. That was, uh, no, he, that was great fun. Gosh, he, we didn't, had no idea then, of course, he couldn't be, a, a, be the doctor later on. But uh, yeah, that, that, that costume, those really <laughs> silly, mad, bonkers costumes. And that helmet he had that we, in rehearsals, we rehearsed at the, what we call the act, the, um, Acton Hilton, it's not there anymore, it doesn't exist, but so, and you mark, everything's marked out on the floor with tape, so you come in a corridor and you go around here, but it's all on the floor, there's no set. So we're merrily you know, rehearsing this scene where Mac, it's Maxwell, isn't it, comes in and he's just starting to have a conversation and he goes out again, blah, blah. We get into the studio and realize that the door frame, he doesn't fit. He can't, he said, what do I do about the hat? The hat doesn't fit through the door, and what am I gonna do? So he said, I'll, I'll carry it. So that's why you see him with his hat under his arm and with the plume. So this became known as Esmeralda. This was Esmeralda was under the arm because it literally would not fit in the set. Do things like that happen a lot? Yes. I would imagine so. <laughs> yes. There's sometimes the communication between what we're rehearsing and what the designer has done is, doesn't quite get there. And, yeah, and, and when there's ever there's an explosion and things like that, you know, there's all oh, this health and safety, blah, 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 blah. And you have to be this distance and it's everyone quiet, blah, blah, blah. And often they'll say it's going to be a really, really big explosion, so make sure everyone's got earphones on who are not in the scene. We don't worry about the actors, but everyone else has got to be. And then you come to it and it goes, well, that was it. But I'd, I did hear someone at some point was told, I've forgotten which, it might have been Fraser actually, I can't remember, that they were told that this wasn't going to be very big and it would be fine. It's just going to be a little thing. And it blew up the whole thing. So everyone was actually so, oh my God. Um, yeah, so I forgot what the question was now. How often things like oh yeah so that. yeah there's there's always there's always something and, and because the studio work is always so um, time limited we've always got 
far too much to do, far more than we've got time to do. And it's always concertina and then something happens here. Lighting doesn't work or there's a problem with the camera and, and it just goes back and back and back. So studio work is, is quite stressful. And at the BBC in those days, you could work till 10 o'clock at night. But after 10 o'clock, um, because of the unions, you know, you, they put literally will pull the plug out. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, the lights go out. And that's it, that's the end of it. So you can imagine a sort of quarter to 10 gets, which is what happened with the regeneration scene between Tom and Peter. It had got pushed back and pushed back in the studio time. And by the time we came to do that, it was literally 10 to 10. And the stress levels rise quite considerably because if you don't get it done, it all has to, you have to come back, the scene has to be reset, it costs lots of money. Um, so, but there was a lot of that. Black Orchid was another one. We were constantly cutting through that. I mean, the, the, the um, floor manager would come up to you and say, OK, in rehearsals, this scene took two minutes and 30 seconds. Make it one minute 50, action. This is Mick Wingert, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to have fun and follow your fandom.